And Charlie Brown's trying to reason with her, and Charlie says, Lucy, you've got to love. You, you can't be so upset. You, you got to love. The world needs love. And Lucy said, I love the world. It's people. I can't stay. <laughs> also, Father, thank you for this day you've given. I thank you for the opportunity we have to look at your word today. I pray you be with us as we take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Help us to understand the principles that are there. Help us to glean from it what you want us to see. I pray you be with some blessed ones come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We skipped ahead several chapters, as I'm sure you know. Uh, we were in 1 Corinthians 8. We should have been in 1 Corinthians 8 today. I went forward to 1 Corinthians 13. We will go back next week. We're not skipping all that. I went forward to this to catch this because it is, in fact, Valentine's Day. I figured it would be good to preach a message on the topic of love. If for no other reason, that love is probably one of the mis most misunderstood things in the entire world. It truly is. American culture can't get it. We can't figure it out at all. I mean, you read the songs, listen to the songs that are sung, love songs, and they all are messed up. You know, they love this person because of this. They love them because of that. They fell in, instantly fell in love with them. That was really there are four words in the Greek language. That mean love. And that's one of the words that, that we would translate in the English as love. And that is what adds to the confusion. Three of them are used in the New Testament. One is not. The word eros is not used in the New Testament. Eros refers to a sensual love. That word is not used in the New Testament. But it would be translated in the English, love nonetheless. Another word that's not used, actually there's another word that's not really actually used. Actually, Eros is it does show up. The other word that doesn't really ever show up is storge, which basically is a familial type of love, a friendship love. Uh, that doesn't really show up there. Philadelphia, <coughs> the Latin love, friendship love, does show up. You know, we get to think the name of the city of Philadelphia from that, the city of Brothers of Shove. You know, comes from that whole idea of phileo love, that the city of Philadelphia was supposed to be a city in which everyone loved each other. That was the idea when William Penn founded it. That was the concept that he hoped for. <clears throat> it didn't happen, but that's what he was hoping for. The other word that's used for love is the word that's used here. And that's the word agape. The, Eng the, language, the, the, Greek, the English translation, at least the King James that was read to you, translates it charity, but the word charity here means love. It's the word agape, love. As I said, there's much misunderstanding as to what love is. From a biblical perspective, what does it refer to? What is it talking about? What I want to look at today, I want to look at the importance of biblical love. And then I want to look at the nature <coughs> of biblical love. I want to look at the importance of biblical love, and I want to look at the nature of biblical love. I want to tell you what love isn't, and I want to tell you what love is from this passage. Now, there's a whole lot of other stuff I could probably throw in there, but I'm going to stick to the passage today. So we're going to look at this today. First of all, I want us to notice, and by the way, what I want us to challenge us today is we need to cultivate in our lives true biblical love. Because in all reality, the commands of Scripture tell us that we are to love one another as Christ has loved us. The early church, the Bible said in, in John 13, said, By this shall all men know you're my disciples by the love which ye have one for another. It was a mark of the early church. It's to be part of our life. It's to be something that is part of us. So if, in fact, that is the case, it's a mark of the early church. It's, we're told in, in, the, in the First Thessalonians that they didn't even need to be taught what it meant or how to do it. It came to them naturally. 
So if in fact it's part of what we're supposed to be, it's supposed to come naturally, it is supposed to be something that is true of us, and we better well know what it is. So I want us to look today at what this is. I want to look first of all at the importance of biblical love. Go with me to verse 1. It says, Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. It says, though I speak, uh, it says, let, it says again, though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. So what is he saying? What he's saying is, first of all, I think what, he, what he's saying is we're meaningless, we are meaningless noise without love though we have great speaking ability. You could be the most articulate person that ever walked on the face of the earth, but if you do not have love, you are like the creaking of a metal gate. You ever listen to a metal gate that hasn't been oiled? That's quite literally what he's saying. It's meaningless noise. It doesn't mean anything. The tinkling cymbal meant nothing. The creaking of the gate means nothing. It doesn't mean anything. So what he's saying is, if we have great ability to communicate the word of God, yet we have no love in our heart, he says, what we're saying is meaningless and worthless. Love. Good one. I just kind of once more an introduction. What's he not talking about? The world. <clears throat> we really in America have a messed up view. We do. We get this idea that, you know, we have, because we use the same word for everything. So you've got puppy love, which is just infatuation. Really, it is. You have puppy love that's infatuation. People get infatuated with each other and they're, <gasps> there's no real love. They don't know each other. They really can't love each other. They don't know each other. But the bottom line is there's this you know, infatuation. Then we have, you know, people get married. Oh, I, you know, they, they pledge their love out the you know, altar. And that's great. But you know what? Most of them, even at that point, don't really love each other. They don't really. They think they do, they want to, but at that point in time, they still haven't gotten to that point. Because love is something we have to grow into, love is something we have to choose to do, regardless of how easy or hard. Because love is a choice, by the way. This word, agape, we'll talk about this in a little bit, is not a feeling. Not at all. Now, true love, you know, we have those watery feelings, and we get the cards, and, and we do that stuff. And, and you know, I'm not saying that I don't, you know, that those feelings shouldn't be there and all that stuff. I'm not saying that. But that's not really love. That's Liking each other, that's friendship. That's actually phileo love more than agape love. It's friendship. It's I like them. They're my buddy. I love them. You know what? And, and don't get me wrong. I've been married 30 years. I can't imagine not being married. I, I can't imagine not having Sandy. I, I really can't. Doesn't mean we don't ever argue. We argue. Doesn't matter. We mean we always agree. We don't always agree. We don't. But the fact of it is, we love each other. But, what is this for say? The importance of biblical love, he says, though we're meaningless noise, if we don't love each other, even if we, have, if we don't have love, even if we have great speaking ability. We're like the creaking of a gate, he says. Number two, look what he says. He says in verse uh, two, and though I have the gift of prophecy, and I am stating all mysteries and all knowledge, and have all faith, so I can remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. So he says, first of all, we're meaningless noise like the creaking of a gate. If we don't have love, even if we're great speakers of the word of God. Number two, he says, we're nothing without love, even if we have great faith and great Biblical knowledge. He says you can know the whole Bible inside and out. You can have faith, he says, to remove mountains. But if you don't have love, he says, you really, 
in God's evaluation are nothing. Wow. That's pretty harsh. What's the next part he says? He says the biblical love, he says, what's the, how important is it? Well, he says we're meaningless if we don't have it. He says we're nothing if we don't have it. What does he say in the verse 3? He says, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Nothing. He says we can profit nothing spiritually, even though we make great personal sacrifices, even to the point of going to the martyr's death. And that's the idea where it took giving my body to be burned. He's basically saying, even if you are a martyr and you give your life for the cause of Christ, if you don't have love, he says, it doesn't profit you. So, what does he say? He's saying, I love you. He's trying to say here, pay attention. <coughs> Look at what I'm going to tell you, idiots. So how important is love? He says, we're nothing if we don't have it. He says, we're meaningless if we don't have it. He says, we have no profit if we don't have it. So what is it? Let's look, let's look at the nature of biblical love. I want to first of all look at the definition of biblical love. The word is agape that's used here. It's translated, as I said, in the King James charity. I'm not 100% sure why they translate it that way, though it's not 100% bad because charity, at least in our mind, we think of charity as giving, and to an extent, that's kind of the nature of what this love is. It's giving. It means not only a practical concern for the welfare of others, but a continual readiness to subordinate one's own pleasures and advantages to the benefit of another. Now, let's say, what does that mean? What that means is this. This is not an emotion. It is a choice. It's volitional. That's why it can be commanded. Did you ever notice that? Love one another as I have loved you. That's a command. How can you command a feeling? I could say to you, be happy. <laughs> be sad. And you, you're like, ah. we're only sad we have to listen to you. And that's basically what you'd be thinking. The bottom line, you cannot command a feeling. But you can command something that is a choice. This word literally means it's a choice. It's based on the worth, not based on the worth of the object it loves. It's based on a choice to love them. That's why the Bible can say in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. As God looked down on the world, do you really believe he saw anything in you and in me worth loving? Well, of course he did. I'm a good person. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 89, by grace you say through faith, not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. God in his evaluation of us was that we were not good people. He said we were sinners. The Bible says it's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. The Bible says in Ephesians, I mean in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, as it is written, yeah, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understand. There's none that seek after God. They've all gone out of the way. They've all together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What is sin? Sin is an overstepping of a boundary. God has set, he set up a, a law that he said we are to abide by. Sin is trespassing that law. How far do you have to trespass before you're really trespassing? How far do you have to step across that line before you really are trespassing? You know, when I was a kid, there was a, a, a piece of property that had no trespassing sign right here. And my, my friend that I we used to all the time go over there, step across the line, step back. Why? Made us feel bad. I don't know. <laughs> it's like you, you see on the bottom of the... Of the uh, and maybe you've never done this. Maybe you were a good kid and never did anything like this. But I remember being honest, a kid seeing on the bottom of the, of the cushions, do not remove this tag under penalty of law. Ripping it off. 
Of course, I got scared and went and hid because I thought somehow the police were going to know that I did it and they were going to show up at my house and I was going to be arrested for tearing off that tag. Don't tell me I was the only one that thought that. <laughs> I know you probably thought it too. Because <laughs> everybody thinks that. Here's a 40 year old little kid. Here's just that. <clears throat> Bottom line is, we are sinners. We were born that way. We've chosen to be that way. Things we have chosen to do that are wrong. And God says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What we have earned, what God says we deserve, the paycheck that we have worked for, he says is death. But God chose to give us something else. He gave us eternal life. He's offered it through Jesus Christ our Lord. The question is, how do you accept it? The Bible says, in, once again, Romans 6, 20, I mean, uh, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Because of God's love for us, he sent his Son to die on the cross for us. In the 16th century, Actually, 17th century. Yeah, 17th century. Oliver Cromwell was the Lord Protector of England. During the period of time when the Puritans took over England, they deposed the, uh, the monarchy that he was uh, then the Lord Protector, was the, was the head of the uh, English government. In one particular situation, there was a soldier who did something. I don't exactly know what he did, but he was. they were told that at the evening curfew bell, he would be shot because of what he did. His family was you know, distraught about it. He knew it was just, that was just what was going to happen. That night, for some reason, the curfew bell never rang. And they wondered why. Cromwell sent out his men to find out why. They brought this man's wife back. Hands all bloody. Body all bruised. Here she had climbed to the tower and held on the bell ringer and pounded against the side of the bell and kept it from ringing. He said, your sacrifice has saved your husband. The curfew bell will never It's Jesus' sacrifice on the cross of Calvary because of God's love for us that has given us an opportunity to be saved. Put our faith and trust in Him because He loves us. That's the meaning of love. He gave His own counsel. That if we believe in Him, we can have eternal life. In this passage, He gives a description of biblical love. He actually tells us eight things love is not. And then He tells us several things that love is. Eight things that it's not. Actually, it looks like eight things that it is. Yeah, eight things it is. There we go. Eight things it's not. Eight things it is. We're going to look first of all the eight things that it's not. Go with me to verse 4. He says, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself is not puffed up. Now I understand you're going to, it's just going to be kind of a, a grocery list here. That's the very nature of this passage because that's the way it was presented. But what he says, the first thing love is not is love doesn't envy. Love isn't envy. Love doesn't covet or begrudge someone else of what is theirs. Love vaunt, it, he says here, love, um, actually in verse, uh, yeah, verse 4. Charity, where are we at? Oh, I, I want to do it. I'm skipping around here because I, I, I'm confusing my own so. He says in verse 4, Charity envieth not. So we're looking at the negative stuff first, then we're going to look at the positive stuff after. That's why I'm skipping some things. I even confused myself there for a second. So he says it's not envy. Love doesn't covet or begrudge. He says, secondly, love doesn't boast. Look at verse 4. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. It's not boasting. The idea there, vaunteth not itself, is actually the idea of boasting or being a braggart, quite literally to the idea of being called a wingbag. He's saying, 
Love isn't a windbag. Love doesn't always talk about what it is. Love doesn't boast. Love isn't proud. He says, look at verse 4. Charity envieth not, charity mourneth not itself, is not puffed up. The word there literally means to be puffed up of oneself, to inflate it, it has an inflated opinion of itself. He says, love doesn't have an inflated opinion of itself. It doesn't think it's so much better than everyone else. This word literally has the idea of being puffed up like a pair of bellows. Speaking of an arrogant individual. Someone who's so arrogant that they can't be talked to. He says love isn't that way. True love is not that way. He says not only is love not envying, love's not boasting, love's not proud. He says love's not rude. Look at verse 5. Doth not behave itself unseemly. The word literally there has the idea of being, um, of being a rude individual. Of being someone who's, the word literally means causing to raise a blush. Love doesn't attempt to be rude and try to embarrass someone all the time. It doesn't, and it's not here referring to being embarrassing because of a joke. It's being embarrassed because of a moral situation. Love doesn't try to embarrass another one because of some bad moral decision. That's the idea of what it's really saying here. He says love's not rude. He says love's not self-seeking. In verse 5, once again, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, is not self-seeking. Love doesn't insist on its own rights, because love often gives up what it is due for the sake of others. Love doesn't go around seeking what it could get, it is willing to give, it seeks not its own. It's not easily angered, in verse 5, he says, um, Doth not behave itself as a seamless seeketh not a road, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, is not easily angered, is not easily provoked. Love is able to put up with some things. Love is able to go through things that would best normally anger a person. And because of love, not be angered. This next one is a really cool one. It says here, Verse uh, seven. No, it's not verse seven. It's verse five. It's number seven. It's number. It's verse five. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not others. Not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Now I will tell you this what this right now. That is it is probably a terrible translation. It doesn't even give the slightest idea of what the word means. Um, it, it's it's not it, it's it, it's not so much the translation issue because it was translated the way the language what it says. But it, they didn't get the nuance of what it really has. The word really is a word that it's, it's the verb that is the root idea here. It comes from the idea of taking account. It's an accounting term. And it literally means to write down in a ledger. So he's, the idea of what he's saying is love doesn't keep a record. Love doesn't Keep a ledger. What is it referring to? Love doesn't keep a ledger of all the wrongs against it. Love doesn't keep a record. Love doesn't write everything down. Love's willing to forget. Love's willing forgives and forgets. So well, I can't forget. You know what? I can't forget. I've got a good memory. Guess what? God chooses not to remember. The Bible says when God forgives us, He puts our sins as far as the east is from the west and remembers them. No more. If you're not, if you don't have a better memory than God, you can do what He did. He chooses not to remember. This word is, it is cool because it's the idea of not writing down. I heard a story, a sad story, a friend, it was actually it was Pastor Jordan. Many of you know Dr. Jordan. He was counseling someone, marriage counseling, and they set up the marriage counseling, the family came in, and when they walked in, the wife and the husband both had huge notebooks. He said, What's, what is that? And they opened the notebooks, and these were, uh, these were records of wrongs against each other that had been recorded back to the very beginning of their marriage. And this had been like years. That's a direct violation of this whole idea of this word. The love doesn't keep a record. Love doesn't write down in a ledger book. Love doesn't say, well, you've done this now the 53rd time this month. Love doesn't record a record. Love keeps no records. Love doesn't let the light in evil. Look at verse 6. 
Bear, uh, verse 6. Uh, rejoice is not iniquity, but rejoice is in truth. The idea that doesn't rejoice is not iniquity, the idea that doesn't delight in things that are wrong. Doesn't delight in wrong. Those are eight things love is not. It doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it's not proud. It is an attempt to be rude. It doesn't is it self-seeking. Love is not self-seeking. Boy, isn't that the opposite of what love is, what people call love nowadays? Love's not self-seeking. Love's not easily angry. Love keeps no record. Love doesn't delight in evil. Those are eight things love is not. What are eight things love is? First of all, love is patient. Look at verse 4. Charity suffers long and is kind. Love is patient. This describes patience with people. That's literally what this has the idea of. It's patience with people. Characterize the person who's slow to get angry in spite of the provocation. It's not, well, I don't get mad as long as nobody makes me mad. Well, that's the idea. How do you get mad if nobody makes you mad? It's easy not to get mad if nobody does anything to you. If you don't poke the lion, it doesn't get mad. You poke the lion, it gets angry. This is referring to the person who is slow to get angry, suffers long. Love is kind. <laughs> the word literally means sweet usefulness. See, a loving person does good to those who, who provoke him. And that's why I think they're bumped right up against each other. Because even when the person is provoking, they're kind. Mark Twain said this, a language that, that kindness is a language the deaf can hear and the blind can read. Love is kind. Love is truthful. In verse 6 it says, Rejoice not in iniquity, but rejoice in the truth. Love tells the truth. Love speaks the truth. Love is truthful. Love bears with it. Look at verse 7. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. This idea, this bears with it, has the idea, it's the opposite of being easily provoked. And this kind of has to deal with circumstances. The other one is dealing directly with people. This kind of has the idea of circumstances within it. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. <coughs> 'Tis above all things to have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover a multitude of sins. What is that referring to? What, is, what does it mean charity covers a multitude of sins? Does that mean that charity lets a person keep doing the wrong thing, keep, keep sinning against God and, and ignoring it? That's not the idea of what it means. But literally what it means is charity is willing to overlook small things people do. You know, every one of us does something to irritate somebody. If you don't think you do, ask somebody sitting near you. Because <laughs> they can probably tell you what it is you do. Because everybody, we all do. We all have irritating things. We do something that is, you know, it, it, it's just that's the way it is. Especially husbands and wives, we live with each other long enough, we do things that irritate each other. We do. And eventually we get to know some of the things that irritate our, our wives, and we hopefully stop doing them, or at least try to. It's just the nature of trying to live together in peace. But the bottom line is what he's saying, and this is referring to the church, he's saying charity is willing to overlook some small things. And therefore, as a result of it, able to get along. You may not like something I say. I may not like something you do. Maybe I don't like the fact that every time, you know, you always do something in the middle of the service. You may not like the fact that I keep walking to the side of the pulpit. I guarantee you that people taping the thing get irritated with that. Because whenever I go to one side, they know what's going on. Then I go to the other side, then they get all confused. Because John's up there trying to turn the camera the entire time. He probably wishes I would stand still. And maybe you do too. But the fact of the matter is, there are things we all do that tend to be irritating. Love can overlook things that are slightly irritating so they can get along. Love covers 
a multitude of sins. See, love bears with it. Love is trusting. Look at verse 5. It says, Doth not, not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Actually, I'm in the wrong verse. Verse 7. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. It says that believeth all things. Love is trusting, not gullible. What it has the idea that it's referring to is has faith in people. It's not saying that love is gullible and can, you know, be fooled all the time. The idea is that love has faith in the person that it loves. That it trusts them and it loves them and as a result of it, it believes them. Love hopes. Look at verse 7. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things. Love sees the bright side of things and doesn't despair. Love lasts. Look at verse 7. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Love preserved. It's preserved. Love can put up with things that aren't so good. You know, that's why the whole part of the whole vow we take in marriage, you know, is for better or for worse, for richer and for poor, for sickness and health. Because guess what? It isn't always going to be peaches and cream. It's not always going to be good. It's not always going to be good that way in a marriage situation. There's going to be tough times. There's going to be hard times. There's going to be difficult times. It's going to be that way in every relationship you ever have. There are going to be times that being a friend of someone is easy, and there's going to be times that being their friend is just plain hard. There's going to be times that being, you know, a, a friend, a, being a, a church member is easy. There's going to be times being a church member is hard. Because there's going to be times we have to put up with things and endure things. There's times that we, if we're going to truly love, we have to preserve it. We have to go through things sometimes. Sometimes. It's easy. Sometimes. It's hard. Love lasts. Love never fails. Look at verse 8. Charity never fails. What he's saying is love survives everything. True love survives it all. So what is love? It's the decision to seek the best for someone else. Even if it's not easy. And as a result of it, it puts up with things. And as a result of it, it doesn't go away. As a result of it, it looks for the good. It hopes. It cares. It's kind. Heard the story. It was supposed to have been um, Paul Harvey. Told the story. A guy, and he named the guy, was driving on the highway. And he's driving on the road, and, and a lady pulls out and sideswipes his car. She gets out of the car. She didn't hit it bad, but just hit it a little bit. She gets up out, and she's all upset, and she's crying, and she's nervous, and she's just a bad <laughs> car. We just got it. I can't, I, you know, and she was all upset. And so they, he tries to calm her down a little bit, and they go to exchange information. She goes over and opens the glove compartment, gets out the envelope with the information, and scrawled across the envelope. In her husband's handwriting was this case of an accident. Remember, I love you, not the car. <coughs> love endures. Love endures. Now, what's some application? We're told to love each other. We're told to, you know. It's an interesting thing. I've had husbands and wives in the past, not here, but in other churches, sit in my office and tell me across the table, I don't love them anymore. And my response has always been this. Are you both safe? Yes. God commands you to love each other. You're also told to love your enemies. Husbands are told to love their wives. They're told to love each other as Christians. We're told to love our enemies on whichever level it is. You're told to love each other. Where love each other? How do you love each other? How do you love others? Well, I think for those around us that don't know the Lord as our Savior, the way we love them is by sharing with them the good news of the gospel. 
by telling them how they can be saved, by being a good example. The way we can love fellow church members is not by not expecting them to be just like you. To be willing to have allow them to be a little bit different. Not to excuse sin. That's not the issue. We're not talking about excusing sin. But be willing to allow them to be a little different. Maybe they won't dress exactly the same. Maybe their interests are not the same. Their abilities are not the same. They're not exactly like you. Be willing to put up with something a little bit different. But don't make fun of them because of it. And don't look down on them because of it. Sometimes love is hard. Sometimes love requires us to rebuke. But don't look for reasons to do it. Don't go around looking for a reason to go telling somebody off. That's just plain wrong. As far as family members, husbands and wives, I don't think I 100% have to explain that. You need to be willing to put up with each other, easy or hard. Be willing to go through the difficult times and the hard times. With our kids. We need to love our kids. How do you do that? <laughs> well, you got to tell them that. you got to discipline them at times. And by the way, that shows love. Doesn't mean give them everything they want. But love is giving. Yeah, you're right. But love gives what's needed. Doesn't mean always giving them what they want. Doesn't mean getting them every clothes style they want. Doesn't mean taking them every activity they want. Because guess what? If they do, you'll spread yourself so thin, you'll become a peanut butter sandwich. <laughs> you need to train them in the Word of God. We have an Awana program now. Get them in the Awana. Get them learning verses. Have them learn the Word of God. Listen to them. Listen to them. Give them the word of God. Again, it doesn't mean giving in to everything they want. There's times we just have to say, no. And that doesn't make you a bad parent. It actually makes you a parent. Anybody can say yes to everything that's going down the pike. Parents have to sometimes say no. It's just part of life. God expects us to love our children. He expects husbands to love their wives. He expects wives to love their children. And by the way, husbands, we're commanded to love our wives with this kind of love. Our wives are actually never commanded to love us this way. Do you know why? Because it's more natural for wives to love this way. It's not as natural for men to love this way. Men have to make a choice. Wives are told to love their husbands with phileo love, a friend. Because they immediately have the other kind of love. This is the kind of love that the friendship love is the one they got to work at. This is the one we got to work at. We're told to do this. We're commanded to love our church members. We're commanded to love our enemies, believe it or not. Love. Misunderstood. <laughs> <laughs> because God says if we don't have it we're like a creaky gate I actually looked around the basement to try to find something to make enough noise to put behind the bolt that I was going to creak it every once in a while I couldn't find anything that was noisy enough. what's that? <laughs> yeah but it wouldn't have been fun I could do it while I was talking <laughs> you know? somebody had been looking to figure out what was wrong <clears throat> This shall all men know in my disciples. I love and have one for another. You know, we want the world to know. We really do. We, we really truly want to reach them. I truly believe we do. They'll know where, they're, where God's disciples by the love we show, not by the way we dress. Not by the big black Bibles we carry. Not by the fact that we can tell them everything that they do wrong. They'll know they love. They'll know we're God's disciples by love. We have one for another. 
Lord, I thank you for this day you've given. I thank you for your word and the challenge of your word to our hearts. Help us, Lord, to love as you commanded. If it was easy, you wouldn't have to command it, Lord. But if it was impossible, you wouldn't have to command it. Lord, help us to love one another. Help us as, parents, as husbands to love our wives, wives to love our husbands, parents to love our children, church members to love each other. Help us to love the world. Enough to reach them. I pray you give us some blessing all this day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Don't be looking around just for a moment. Maybe you're here today and the Lord has spoken to your heart. He's challenged you. Maybe you're here today and there's never been a time you've put your trust in Jesus Christ. You don't know for sure if he would die right now where he's going to go. You just don't know. Maybe you've been trusting the church. Maybe you've been trusting good works. And trusting in maybe who you're related to, your you know, relative, a famous preacher or whatever. You're, you're trusting in that. None of those will get you. The Bible says in, John, in uh, Titus 3, 5 and 6, uh, Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he said this is not by anything I can do. It's by his mercy. Maybe here today the Lord has spoken your heart. Say, I don't know for sure if I would die right now where it's going to turn, but I want to know a little bit about that. Please pray for me. If you raise your hand, I'll pray for you again. I want to know. I don't know. I see your hand. Maybe here today the Lord has challenged you. See, I've been challenged with the idea of being loving in the way God wants me to. God's committed to be spoken to your heart. Please pray for me. I want to be the kind of loving person God wants me to be. I want to show the Lord. Maybe you're the Lord's challenged you. There's a need in your heart that He's spoken to you about, and I didn't even talk about. It. And that's the cool thing about the Lord. Yeah. You say the Lord has spoken to me about another need or something that He's been convicting me about, working in my heart for days, weeks, maybe just a few last few moments. But He's been bearing down on my heart. Please pray for me. There's a need in my life. You ready to go? Father, I thank you for this day you've given. I thank you for your word and the challenge of your word. I pray you be with us. Help us to honor you in all we do. I pray you bless now. Help us to honor you in Jesus' name. Take your hymn book if you would and turn with me.